I was going to speak to you all about being an optimist. I am pretty optimistic. I think it gets me through most of my days. Um, I'm sort of almost annoyingly optimistic, actually, sometimes, I think. Um, but I feel that defiant optimist is now becoming my label. Um, it feels difficult sometimes to be optimistic, particularly in the face of the challenges that we've been talking a lot about today, climate, um, biodiversity or the lack of. So here I am and I thought, wow, I've got to speak about optimism. And I, I flip and I flop through this state of being really optimistic and then utter despair. And, um, you know, I sort of like, yeah, I, I force myself out of that state a lot. And I think, nope, you know, I've got to kind of be buoyant and upright, you know, and um, uplifting and positive and have that energy to put out into the world because that's what I believe. Um, is going to keep moving things forward. But um, I read a little, it's like on a social media post, and I read the lines that we live in an age of, um, of loss, despair, and hope, all at the same time. So I figured, I guess maybe that is the key, is, is feeling both, or having time to move between one and the other. So um, I'm not sure what day you've caught me on today, so I have no idea where this is going to go because it's a presentation that I haven't really prepared. Um, I do a fooling workshop with um, a lady called Frankie Anderson, and um, she was part... I'm sorry, I'm just going to take this off because it feels like it's the right thing to do. So she was part of a circus um, company, if you like, in Bristol about 15, 20, 30 years ago called Circle Media. Some of you may have heard of her, I don't know. Anyway, Frankie runs these fooling workshops, and today is the first time that I think I'm going to need that. <laughs> because um, the approach with what she does is um, the ability to find what she calls the zero. The point when your energy, um, everything that's gone before kind of fades to nothing, and then you wait to see what comes out of that. And the process of everything, my life's experiences, my work, my experiences as a mother, as a friend, as a daughter, a sister, all these things, you know, presenter, um, has led me to this point right now on this stage before you all. And I'm going to do what Frankie does. It's quite... So I've never actually done this for real outside of those workshop environments. But it is um, about letting whatever energy now comes up, come up. So, what I was going to talk about, and probably will continue to talk about, was about optimism and how this is a mindset that I feel is really, really important in the work that um, the kind of people that I meet uh, through my, my line of work nowadays, which is mainly conservationists, environmentalists, campaigners, um, volunteers, amazing naturalists, um, plastic pollution fighters, all that stuff. Um, and, and actually, I, I've missed out a really important group of people there, people that I speak to a lot as well, school children. Um, particularly among young people, I find there is a lot of anxiety, a lot of despair, and a real sense of, yeah, but what, what can we do? I mean, that's probably the most frequently asked question um, after, you know, where did I get my shoes or something like that. Um, but honestly, it, it is the one question that I get asked a lot is what can we do? Or it's how can we change this? And if I'm honest, I don't actually have the answers. I mean, there's lots of things that I could tell people that I think they should do. But um, although I believe you know, that I sort of, I want to be an advocate for um, the things that have no voice, you know, um, whether it's um, insects, nature, soil biology, um, disenfranchised people, whoever, I don't even know who these people are or what these things are, but I do believe that, you know, if you can speak up, speak up. 
But I don't really feel that it's my place to tell people what they should do. And if I can be perfectly honest, it's because I actually think that if we really, really listen, I think we actually already know what we need to do. So for me, it's a question of mindset. Um, it's a question of being able to see or at least keeping a part of your mind open to the possibility that change can happen, that things can actually change and change for the better. Um, and that's because I, you know, as a kind of slightly sort of science, I, I, I am a scientist, but I'm also quite superstitious. Um, my, my sort of background is quite complicated, but just to quickly counter through it, I'm basically Creole, which means Although I was born in Kenya, I live here, I've lived in lots and worked in lots of places, but I really don't really come from anywhere because I can't put a flag and say, this is my, this is my land, this is my country, these are my people. Um, I am a black woman and I identify as such, um, but that's it. That's pretty much the, the, the main thing I can kind of identify as. So for me, um, mindset is really, really important because it's... Um, it's where you keep a part of your mind open to the possibility of change. So at this point, I was going to show you. So I'm now going to have this imaginary presentation behind that's going to help me along. <laughs> at this point, I was going to show you um, a YouTube video. It's available for everyone to see. It's public domain. Um, a YouTube video, and if you want to look it up later, it's called The Unchained Goddess. It was made in 1953. It was funded by an American telecommunications company called The Bell. Oh, they, oh, it's called Bell. And the series was called The Bell Science Hour. And in it, it starts off, and it's the kind of thing where you sort of imagine that you want to dim the lights, and everyone sort of gets their popcorn, it gets really, really sort of comfy. It's that sort of old sort of newsreel-type music, crackly film, grainy film. And um, the music comes up, and then this, da da, this, the, the title, The Unchained Goddess. And then what follows are two scientists, two men, um, and one of them sort of quite haplessly goes, Well, do you think we can really change the weather? And the scientist, his, his counterpart, his, you know, his co presenter, goes on to explain, gives a really simple and clear explanation, all set to very comical animated footage of Miami and Florida sort of sinking slowly underwater. He gives an amazing, clear, succinct description of what we now understand as um, climate change induced by human activity. So he describes how our industrial processes and our lifestyles are producing lots of carbon dioxide and that's going into the atmosphere. And if this continues unchecked, um, changes will occur in the climate, the polar ice caps will melt, sea levels will rise and all kinds of other things that we've yet to predict will happen. This was in 1953. The first time I saw this, it, what struck me is, wow, we've known this for a really, really long time. And the next thing that then popped in my head was, why has nothing happened? Why has nothing changed? And at this point in my imaginary talk that's now behind me, <laughs> um, you would now be seeing a photo of me, what I call little me, me as a six-year-old. Um, it's a photo of me as, as a six-year-old um, in the doorway of our house. I'm barefoot in what was actually not dissimilar to what I'm wearing today. This is my mom's. Um, we, we had similar things made. And um, so it was quite a similar outfit, but very small me. And I, I, whenever I do a talk, I like to use that photo, partly because it's a cue for me, like in, you know, sort of a secret little kind of tool that I use. And it helps me connect to um, the person that, kind of started me on this journey. The person that really had very clear ideals of the way I thought we should treat each other, the planet, all those things. And this is what I meant earlier when I say, when I, th I think we actually already know what we need to do. I think um, it is actually quite simple. So little me was born um, in the 70s in Kenya. I was born... Um, yeah, it was just a little, little, 
a little less than a decade after Kenya gained independence from Britain. And I was born into a middle class family. And middle class, in Kenya anyway, doesn't have the same connotations as it does here. To, you know, for me, that simply means I was born in a fam into a family that wasn't too poor, wasn't too rich, we were just somewhere in the middle. And um, my dad was a mechanic. He was very outdoorsy. He, he wouldn't have even described himself as such. He simply liked taking us camping and doing things like that. Um, my mom, we had an unusual family dynamic. My mom was the professional. She was the maid breadwinner. Um, she had gone on to do her master's degree. She was a journalist. So school holidays, I'm assuming childcare must have been an issue. Um, she would take me with her to work. And work, by the time I came along, she worked as a journalist before I was born. Um, but by the time I came along, she worked for the United Nations Environmental Program. And she would take me to work with her. And I had a great time. There was actually a lot to do just outside her office. There was streams and little ponds and things. And I spent a long time like looking at dragonflies and just losing myself in, in that world. But in her office, in, her, in the room where she worked, the walls were plastered with leaflets and all sorts of things, and lots of posters. And there was one poster that caught my eye. So this was about five or six years old. And it was a real classic sort of 70s graphic. It was this big water drop and the swirly sort of 70s writing in it. And in it, it said, every drop counts. And that was the moment that I became aware. And I think it is literally that moment that I became aware that all was not well in the world. And as I grew up, partly because of my mom that was, we were, and, and dad as well, um, words like water conservation, soil erosion, deforestation, water, you know, air pollution, all those things, that, was just, that became part of my vocabulary. So even, you know, sort of we've got 1953, Unchained Goddess, we've got me, you know, this is sort of my journey as an environmentalist. Um, you know, being born into a world where all, a lot of information was already available about our impact on the planet. Um, and probably like most kids, and you know, I've been watching the kids out there while we've been in here. And, you know, if I'm honest, I've watched them and I think that is what they're supposed to be. They should not be worrying about our planet. They should be out there playing, you know. So like them, when I was that age, although these were words and ideas and concepts that I was being exposed to, I was doing what they're doing. I, I played, you know, I had fun. I scratched around the dirt. We didn't have any devices, but there were beetles. There's my daughter leaving. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, so I was aware that things were wrong, but I, so I guess, labored on the impression that it was in hand, that we got this. Somebody had it anyway. Um, get to the point where I'm doing my biology degree. Still a lot of information out there. Still a lot growing growing concerns about, you know, the state of the environment, our planet, etc. Still with this sense that, well, we know this, we have this information, and, you know, it's being dealt with. Um, so fast forward to 2016, 2017. A lot of things happened that year. A lot of things happened, you know, personally in my life. By that point, my, my daughter and son um, were born. They're leaving now because I'm talking about them. <laughs> um, <laughs> they're like, oh, here she goes again. Um, <laughs> it is important that they were there. <laughs> they're very important to me. Um, 2017 and 2016, important years for all sorts of reasons. Um, one reason for me, um, not, nothing to do with my kids, was a scientific paper was published in a, a journal called Bioscience. And it was called an open letter, a warning to humanity, an open letter. And it was called a second notice. So in 2017, uh, this paper had 15,534 members of the scientific community sign, put their names to that paper. The, 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 there was, I think, something like over 500 A4 sides of signatures and in signatories that went and backed up what that paper said. And essentially, what 
they were doing, because the reason why I was called a second notice is that 25 years earlier, so 1992, again, for me, another landmark year, that's when I began my degree, my biology degree in Bristol. In 1992, they had issued the first notice warning to humanity. And this was essentially saying, we, are on, we will compromise the natural systems of the planet if we continue as we are. As scientists do, they backed up with lots of graphs and information and data and all that sort of stuff. But what they did in 2017 is they said, well, it's been 25 years since we gave humanity their first notice. Let's see how well we've responded. <laughs> so in 25 years, they had, um, I mean, simplified, there was, you know, so at this point, I've rolled on to the next um, image of my presentation. Um, there was a series of graphs, nine to be exact, various indicators of environmental health, environmental trackers. And it wasn't looking good. In 25 years, things hadn't simply not improved. They'd actually gotten a worse, and a lot worse. So in 2017, when I saw this paper, I'm really, at this point, in a, point, at a state of despair. Um, I can't understand why nothing has changed um, in, in such a long time. In, you know, in my whole lifetime, nothing has changed. It's gotten worse, apparently. Um, at this point, I've moved to Cornwall with my family. And it's r really hard to ignore plastic pollution when you live by the sea. At that point, it hadn't quite gained the sort of public attention and the attention it receives now. It was still a very much a fringe concern campaign. Um, but it really is hard to, to ignore it. So that was sort of like adding to this sense of despair. Um, and at that point as well, um, my, and this is not something I talk about very often in public, but it feels like the right time to talk about it because we're talking about despair. That was also when my marriage ended. And so it was a really, really, really low ebb for me. You know, it felt like everything was wrong. Um, and, and then I had this, very, very funny dream. <laughs> Sounds like a beginning of a big speech, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> don't worry, I'm not going to do that one. <laughs> it was a dream, though. I did have a dream. Um, and it was, it was a bizarre dream. I was very much in the throes. I think it was like my whole identity had, had sort of been taken apart. Um, my identity, identity as a wife, as, you know, um, the, you know, the life partner of somebody, all that stuff had fallen apart. And this dream, I was in our family home, and I was wandering around the house, and it was all quite calm, there's nothing sort of dramatic going on. And I kept finding these doors, and doors to rooms, that I, well, doors that I didn't even know existed in my house. And I'd open the door, and there was a room I didn't even know I had. And it was full of, like, amazing furniture, untouched. Obviously, I'd forgotten about this room, and I thought I'd walk around. I couldn't believe. I was really kind of annoyed with myself. Like, how can I forget that there's this room in my house that's ready to go? And so it continued, and I was, like, getting really confused and lost in my own house because it's now this huge thing. And then I finally found the door out. And then outside, we lived right on the seafront. We don't really, but we did in my dream. And along the seafront was just these you know, chairs and like a cafe, uh, ready to go. And I, at this point, I mean, I was just like kicking myself. I was like, how could I forget that I had this and I haven't got any customers because I haven't promoted it. And I woke up, you know, it wasn't even sort of upsetting. I was just like, oh gosh, to-do list, where is it? Let's start. And it was a very bizarre dream, and I kind of was trying to sort of work out, you know, the significance. I did a hint earlier that I am slightly superstitious. I, I occupy both worlds. Um, so that's why I was telling you I was Creole. Yeah, in my grandmother's, like, so there's a lot of superstition, you know, juju. So, you know, there's a part of me that, like, when I get a dream, I'm like, what does it mean? So, um, so the dream. <laughs> the dream was the only meaning I could attach to it. Um, was I had everything I needed. And that it was actually beyond material needs. Because at that point, I was thinking, I need to rebuild my life. Um, I've been a stay-at-home mom for many years. I had been working in TV before I had my children. Um, but 
you know, sort of when, when things fell apart, I was like, right, well, I, I'm going to start again. I was considering all sorts of things. I was going to retrain as a physiotherapist or maybe I'd go back to uni. All of it was like, it felt like I kept hitting a wall because I needed money to do all those things. And this dream just kind of it came to me and I thought, actually, I have everything I need to continue with something, you know. So for me... I tell that story now, not quite in so much detail, but I do tell the story about this dream um, in other talks because I, I still see a significance in when we are sort of in a state of despair about the environment, about um, human impacts on the environment, all that stuff, the future. And there's this, I think, and this is a scientist, a real scientist thing to do, a temptation that you've got to kind of spin faster, think your way out of this problem. There's something we can do. We must be able to fix it. There is definitely a place for that. I'm not saying there isn't. But I also feel that that moment where you kind of stop and just have that moment and think, I think, I think I've got it. I think I know what I need to do. Um, I think I have everything I need in order to continue. It's, it's, it's that, so it brought me a real sense of peace and it felt like there was real possibility. And I'll, I'll be honest, I won't go into the details of how I made that work in practice, but it worked. It really worked for me. So that was the beginning for me of switching despair into something that looked a bit more like optimism. I wasn't quite there yet at the time. So back into the world of conservation and environmentalism, at this point, um, I realized I had everything I needed, i.e. skills, knowledge, um, you know, and I thought, well, I'd always assumed I would never work in TV again because I couldn't see how being a mum and um, working in a job that requires you to travel quite a bit was ever going to work. But I thought, I will see how I can try and make it work in a way that I need it to work for my children, for myself, and, and also align with something I, I know that deep down I care about, which is a planet. So like I said, by this point, I'm living in Cornwall. I'm really, really, like, on a daily basis being reminded visibly that we are having a huge impact on the planet, not just from, you know, the plastic washing up on the beaches, but <laughs> I actually became a real nuisance caller at the Cornwall Council because I got obsessed with dog poo bags. It was like, it just, to me, was like, this is so simple. We could fix this so quickly. Why don't they just, you know. Anyway, so I, you can see I'm about to go away run with that one. But, um, yeah, so I became much more engaged in the first and main reason why I got into natural history TV in the first place, which was because of the environment. And the timing was really interesting because I couldn't see it at the, you know, not even what's three years ago now that I'm talking about. Um, I took a story to, at the time, the only place I thought would take this story, which was Springwatch. And the story was of um, a completely, apparently spontaneous recovery of a species that had gone extinct in Britain. And this was a tiny little thing. It was a hermit crab the size of my thumbnail called, at the time, it didn't have a common name, it was so obscure, it was called Clibonaris erythropus. And I took this story to Spring Watch, I said, this is pretty cool, you know, this, is, this isn't my story to tell because, you know, there have been lots of volunteers and marine biologists working on this, but they've asked me to approach you because I have the, the contacts, because this is where I used to work, but, you know, basically, this is a hermit crab that was, um, went extinct as a result of the Torrey Canyon oil spill in 1969. This was the biggest environmental disaster of, at its time. Um, the oil slicks actually didn't do the main damage. They did do some damage. But what really, really um, caused most environmental damage was the chemical dispersants they used to clear it up. Um, highly toxic, especially to invertebrate life. So Clibonarius, this hermit crab, was one of many casualties. And in, by the early 80s, it was declared extinct. And everyone had given up. And then in spring of 2016, in March of 2016, there was a, a routine volunteer-led um, survey of one of the beaches in Falmouth. The, the kind of beach that you just rock up with your deck chairs and you know, have an ice cream and have a really nice day on the beach. On that beach, um, the 12th of March, they, the volunteers knew they'd found something unusual. 
center often, of course, it was identified as Clibonaris, and they, they looked all the records, and yes, they, you know, they'd had the odd specimen, but nothing big enough to suggest it had survived several winters. This one was. So it was a really exciting story because it was a story of a natural recovery without any human intervention, no conservation management, biodiversity action plans in place. This little thing managed somehow to make its way back. And to my utter surprise, they said yes on Springwatch and they covered it. And you know, that was my, the first story I covered on Springwatch. I went on and have, you know, had I consider the real privilege of since then being the bearer of good news, I like to say, on Spring Watch. I tend to cover stories like that because I like them. I think they're important to be told because we don't hear them enough. I don't think, anyway. Um, I went on last spring to do um, the whole three weeks on Spring Watch, so from that one story. And in 2016, um, sorry, 20, so this is last year, 2018. Um, those three weeks of Spring Watch, I did one week in Shetland, super exciting, really remote and beautiful, amazing wildlife. The last week I was going to be based in Cornwall, my home patch. And then the second week, sandwiched in between, in between those two, was Yorkshire. And if I'm really honest, I hadn't given it a huge amount of thought until we arrived um, to do the filming in Yorkshire. And to my utter surprise, I imagined we'd either be going to sort of, you know, the coast or the dales or somewhere sort of very natural looking. We were, we sort of pulled up after journeying all the way from Shetland to a premier inn just off the motorway. And I was like, okay, this is interesting. And we were literally in this triangle between Leeds, Barnsley and Pontefract. And, um, or Ponte Carlo, as I like to call it down there. Um, but, it, yeah, so we, we arrived and um, we were going to be filming at a series of RSPB reserves. And on the Sunday, I basically went there to sort of scout, to, to familiarize myself with the location, to recce it. And I met a guy called Darren Starkey, who was the site manager. And he took me around the first site, which was RSPB Fairburn Ings. And he showed me the sort of wildflower meadows, meadows that they're seeded. He talked me through the species records, the number of the birds, you know, that they've recorded there, invertebrate life, um, all the kind of restoration work they're doing. And it kind of was just, it sounded familiar, but I wasn't really connecting with it. It was sort of, um, there's something missing. And we'd got onto this, up to this sort of hill, this, inc you know, this raised, elevated area of the reserve. And we looked across the river, and there were these cottages just across. And, and I was like, oh, wow, you know, that's, that's really close to where the reserve is. And he said, well, those are the old miners' cottages. And all of a sudden, something started to sink in for me. And I said, well, these, I, I kind of have a memory of this as a, as a sort of young teenager watching the miners' strikes in the news. And um, Darren sort of, he dropped to his knees at that point, and um, he, he didn't propose, but he, um, he, he started scratching around in the dirt, sort of in the topsoil, and started pulling out these lumps. And he says, that's, that's what we're standing on. This is one of the spoil heaps. And he goes, right here, the, the people that lived in those cottages, um, they were, you know, during the worst of the strikes, they were starved into submission. They would come up here and scratch around for things like this, lumps of, tiny lumps of coal to heat their homes in. And in that moment, like Darren came alive. I came alive. We absolutely connected with the story of that place. He then sort of, you know, he went back to his main, his, the site office and he pulled out photos. And I wish I could show you because this would be part of it, but you're gonna have to use your imagination. He pulled out these photos of a scene that I would have thought was just scorched earth. It was like a post-apocalyptic scene, as far as the eye could see, on a scale that I couldn't even imagine, actually. The, the earth had been scraped bare. All that was left was not even top, so just bare earth. And to then paint the scene, roll forward. I mean, bearing in mind that mining ceased in some of these reserves like a little more than 20 years ago. Where I stood to make, to pre present those scenes for Springwatch last spring was in meadows that came up to my hip. 
There was um, reed beds. There was a mosaic of habitats. And the, the real testament to how rich that environment was was the fact that there were things like spoonbills, which if you're into your birds, are quite exciting birds in this country to see. Spoonbills not just sort of being recorded and seen there. They were actually nesting for the first time at Fair Burnings. That's the reason why we went there. You had nesting bitterns. Um, again, you know, a, a type of heron, of, you know, very, very difficult to see bird and not nesting in many sites across the UK. That these birds chose to put down and start raising their young in these reserves is like a ringing endorsement of how quickly that area has regenerated. And for me, it's when I, for the first time, and I'll be honest, I started to believe my own hype. Because until that point, I would outwardly be a conservation optimist, but inwardly was very despairing. But when I saw how quickly these changes came about in these reserves, I really, really, and, and I really stand here before you today with that absolute knowledge in my heart that, that these changes can happen and they can happen really quickly. So for me, that was just blew me away. From then on, it's like I've been looking, because I think that's what, you know, that, that's my job. I need to harvest, look, glean all these stories, these um, signs of change, signs of hope, any clues of where things have changed for the better, or what we would like, I guess, well, as environmentalists, I would say, for the better. Um, but yeah, where these changes have happened, and to start looking at how they came about, are there similarities, are there patterns? That's a scientist in me that tries to kind of work out, you know, what can we learn from this? So the next story that I then started to really look at, so the ingredients so far, I'll just recap, we had a hermit crab that just showed up unannounced. To me, that was just, that's a power of nature of a story. Like without any help, nature can recover, just give her an inch and she'll take a mile. Um, the second story was, was Yorkshire. To me, that was a story of how people and land can heal together. And I, and I kid you not, the people that, that live around those reserves in Yorkshire feel such pride about what, has, what changes have been there. And you know, these are deprived communities. I mean, you can stick them all kinds of demographic boxes if you want. Um, but they are really proud of what's been done there. And that's not just the sort of, you know, the birders and the naturalists. You know, the old miners, the um, retired ex-miners who go there now and just love it. So, so that's, you know, those are the clues there, you know, for people, can, people and nature healing together. That was, for me, that was the significance of that story. But then the next sort of real aha moment for me was meeting a farmer in Cornwall called Christopher Jones. Now, Christopher's probably, I'm guessing, somewhere in his early mid-60s. His family have, you know, worked, farmed this little pocket of a valley called Lad Ladock or Ladock, depending on who you, where you come from, Ladock Valley. And um, it's, he's got a farm called Woodland Valley Farm. And just after the war, his brother and his father and himself, they identified a part of their farm that wasn't really good for pasture. So it kept flooding, it was very close to the river, it was very bogged down, very heavy clay soil. Um, they decided that they would plant it with trees. And they thought, well, you know, it'd be a little woodland, it'd be, you know, be nice to see what, you know, wildlife, you know, be a nice legacy is what they felt. And, you know, we can coppice it for wood, et cetera, et cetera. Roll on however many decades um, to a few years back, a couple of years ago again. And um, the village, of Ladock, which lies downstream from Chris's farm, had experienced lots and lots of flooding. And the consensus, the interpretation was this flooding was only going to get worse um, as a result of you know, climate change, climate crisis, etc. So the villagers got together. I, I mean, I'm, I'm oh, massively simplifying this story, but this is the essence of it. The people of Ladock got together. Um, Wildlife Trust, Cornwall Wildlife Trust at the same time had been working on a project and they were really struggling to find a site. And the project was introducing, reintroducing beavers as an experimental site in Cornwall. They could not find anyone who would give up their land 
for such a project, the perception being that the, the beavers would destroy it. Chris is, was the kind of missing piece in that puzzle. Chris, for reasons, I, I'm still trying to get to that, the nub of why, but he was so excited about the thought of being, of his land being the home of the first reintroduction project of beavers in Cornwall. And this trifecta came together, this per, you know, perfect sort of partnership between people, a crowdfunded project, the Wildlife Trust, and a farmer. And Chris's, this area that he planted with his dad and his brother was basically identified as the ideal place to introduce these beavers. Now, being a man and, uh, you know, at the point uh, you know, that he is in his life, you would expect him to maybe be a bit no nostalgic or have this huge emotional attachment to the land that he planted with his father, who's you know, long gone, and his brother. Not so. He, he's like, when you visit that site now with him, he's, I mean, there's something about him that's still so, he's got this playful energy. Um, curiosity, you know, willingness to see, you know, possibilities, things differently. He has not shut down uh, and become sort of entrenched in one way of thinking. And it was just so much fun being able to watch Chris and watch how this land had been transformed. And the thing that really struck me as we stood there and looked at this, the, the project now, it's, I mean, a beautiful sight now. Um, it's really kind of bursting with so much life, is that Chris was willing to give over something that he had planted himself. But not just that, he was willing to give over land whose um, the benefits, you know, as the beaver introduction sort of takes place. The benefits of this project he is unlikely to see in his lifetime because it is going to be about 30, 40 years before the true benefits of um, the beaver reintroduction program comes into play. So, for me, that was sort of the other kind of really important ingredient in terms of this optimism of things can change. The beavers, they made huge changes very, very, very quickly, but it's having this long-term thinking. And I think that's been said before today. But the last, and I think this is the, the biggest, literally biggest good news story there is out there as an environmentalist, as a conservationist, and actually just for people, is um, the one that I think is not told enough, and that's about the ozone hole. And the fact that the ozone hole is recovering. So for anyone who's, I'm sure most people here are familiar, but very quickly, in the sort of late 80s, early 90s, um, on the news, very simply in the way my teenage brain interpreted it, there was a hole over the South Pole, it was getting bigger and we're all gonna die if we didn't do anything about it. Now, the key thing that happened there is we did do something about it. Governments got together very, very quickly, within three years of the scientists kind of said, flagging up there's a problem, had passed legislation which essentially banned the use of the chemical, the smoking gun, um, that was creating, that was eating away at this layer of our atmosphere, the ozone layer, and essentially leaving us vulnerable to ultraviolet radiation. The reduction, so I mentioned this bioscience paper that um, everything was bad news. There was one bit of good news in that paper, which is that CFC levels, the chemicals that are eating away at our ozone layer, have reduced. And to me, that is one of the most important things to keep in mind when we think about climate change, particularly, that our behavior can change very quickly and that we can make an impact on a planetary scale that we have already done it once. Now I know it's not a like for like situation and you can shoot down and you can pick holes into that, the kind of thinking there. But to me that is the thinking, it's the essence of thinking it has been done once. We do not know the hows, the whys, how we're gonna get there with climate change, but we do know we've done it once. And I really believe change can happen, it can happen really, really quickly. It's just the decision to change that can take a long time. Thank you.